Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and this is the discussion on lab 27, renal function. So just a review um, of the renal vascular anatomy. We can see that um, there is a renal portal system involving uh, the nephrons within the kidney. So the afferent arterial is bringing uh, blood to the first part of the nephron, the renal corpuscle made up of the Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. So we know that a portal system is made up of uh, two, uh, two capillary uh, networks, um, one right after the other. So we can see that the first uh, set of capillaries are the glomerular capillaries. Um, and then uh, the plasma, about 20% uh, of it is filtered into the renal tubules, 80% will then leave the glomerulus through the efferent arterial and then enter the paratubular capillaries which uh, go along the different parts of the renal tubule. Um, so the first uh, capillary system we can see is part of the glomerular capillaries and then the second uh, capillary network are the paratubular capillaries. So we can see uh, two sets of capillaries making up the renal portal system. Now in this uh, diagram, it's actually an oversimplified diagram showing uh, reabsorption and secretion occurring along the whole length of the tubules. Uh, and you can see the arrows showing, you know, purple with an F for filtration and then uh, the green R for reabsorption, meaning uh, the ultrafiltrate uh, that has been filtered uh, from the plasma in the bone, in the uh, glomerulus to the first part of the tubule uh, can be reabsorbed uh, from the lumen of the tubule to the blood. Uh, secretion occurs when we have uh, secretion of substance from the blood back to the lumen and then uh, we finally have excretion occurring in the collecting ducts. Now again, it's oversimplified in the fact that it doesn't show that the majority of reabsorption actually takes place uh, early on in the proximal convoluted tubule, whereas the majority of secretion occurs late in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so um, that's something that you need to take note. So just a review of the different elements of the nephron. So the nephron is, again, made up of two main parts. You have the renal corpuscle uh, and the renal tubules. The renal corpuscle made up of the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. And then the renal tubules uh, made up of your subsets of tubules, such as first the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, directly attached to the Bowman's capsule. Then you have the different parts of the uh, loop of Henle or the nephron loop. So you have the part of the loop of Henle going down. This is a descending limb. And then the ascending limb of the loop of Henle going back to the cortex of the kidney. And then you have the distal convoluted tubule and all distal convoluted tubules will then drain into the uh, collecting ducts. And whatever, once you hit the collecting ducts, as they say, you're in, or urine is what is excreted. So we know that plasma becomes ultra filtrate. Uh, so whatever plasma is filtered into the proximal convolute tubule, it goes through that filtration membrane and it's known as ultrafiltrate. So ultrafiltrate is protein and cell free. So none of the cellular formed elements are within this um, ultrafiltrate. So filtration occurs from the blood, um, the plasma, to the tubule lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule. This is then known as ultrafiltrate. So uh, renal corpuscle, plasma will go from the glomerulus uh, to the Bowman's capsule of the nephron. 
Um, and then we have processes of uh, reabsorption as well as secretion. So the majority of reabsorption takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, basically, with reabsorption, uh, substances will go from the tubule lumen to the blood within the paratubular capillaries. So um, again, in the renal tubule, it will go from the nephron, um, majority from the uh, proximal convoluted tubule. Also, we do have reabsorption occurring in the lube of Henle as well as the distal convoluted tubule. Um, and then it'll be reabsorbed by the paratubular capillaries. Secretion. Secretion occurs basically the blood is getting rid of stuff we don't want. So secretion, uh, we have movement of substances from the blood to the lumen of the tubule. For example, in the renal tubules, we have the, uh, the substances from the paratubular capillaries going back to the nephron, specifically the majority of secretion occurring in the distal convoluted tubule. Basically, the things we want to keep, we reabsorb, and the majority of this occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, and the things that we don't want, we secrete into uh, the urine, occurring mostly uh, in the distal convoluted tubule, and then everything, uh, the distal convoluted tubules draining into the collecting duct, and uh, the collecting ducts uh, go uh, and um, excrete urine. We know that the, about 80% of the plasma uh, remains in the glomerulus. So 20% of the plasma will be filtered into the proximal convoluted tubule. So here we have a plasma volume entering the afer and af, uh, arterial. We'll say it at 100%. So 80% remains and 20% is filtered, uh, becomes ultra filtrate. <clears throat> and a little over 19% of that fluid is reabsorbed. Um, so 1% of the ultrafiltrate, a little less than 1% of what is filtered is excreted uh, to form urine and uh, goes to the external environment. We have something called urine production rate. This is how much urine is produced in a given time. And we actually measured urine production rate in our lab. So volume is a measure of urine production rates. Um, we know that how much urine is produced in a given time. So in the lab, we asked a student to urinate and that will be time zero. We then have them drink a certain amount of fluid. Um, and then after 30 minutes, this is known as the void interval time. We ask them to urinate and we measure the amount uh, that has been urinated within 30 minutes. So for example, if they were able to get a 36 milliliter sample within 30 minutes, we take that volume divided by 30 minutes and we get a uh, production rate of 1.2 milliliters per minute. A uh, normal range of uh, volume urine production rates is uh, anywhere between 0 0.5 to 5 milliliters per minute. Um, anything more than that or less than that uh, could be an indicator of some underlying pathology. So we know that uh, the combination of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion will determine the concentration of various ions in plasma and urine. For example, sodium concentration. If we have excessive sodium concentration in our body, the only way to get rid of it is through urination. Uh, we know the pH is determined by the presence of hydrogen ions. Uh, our kidneys, along with our lungs, are responsible for maintaining the acid-base balance within our body. Uh, lungs can breathe out more carbon dioxide to help with acid-base balance. With our kidneys, we can excrete hydrogen ions in our urine. So the pH of blood is around 7.4 uh, and can drop due to either excessive carbon dioxide or lactic acid, uh, but we do have buffers that allow us to homeostatically regulate pH. 
Um, you can increase or decrease pH through negative feedback and antagonistic controls. Now we know that urine is more concentrated than blood because we reabsorb most of the fluid back, but not the hydrogen ion. Um, if hydrogen ion is more concentrated, pH is going is going down. So again, um, pH urine pH is lower than blood because it is more concentrated, usually more concentrated with hydrogen ions. Specific gravity is just a measure, measure of concentration of solutes within urine. Um, increased concentration within the urine usually means an increase in uh, specific gravity. And um, it's determined by, by density. Um, and we compare it to the density of water. So the ratio of density within our urine versus uh, density uh, within water. And we know that water doesn't have anything in it. It's just water. So uh, specific gravity of water is about 1.0. Urine is basically water with stuff in it, with solutes. Um, so we expect specific gravity to be greater than that of the specific gravity of water, so it should be greater than 1. And typically ranges uh, between 1.005 to 1.040. If we take a look, in our lab we had to compare the color of water to kind of get an idea of the specific gravity of the urine sample. And we used um, this indicator to compare the color of urine after we added uh, a few chemicals to it. So we can see that the lighter color indicates um, a lower specific gravity, meaning that there are less solutes within uh, this sample. If you ever uh, get to work in a clinical setting, you know that we can actually get an idea of a patient's hydration status by their color of their urine. Uh, if a patient's urine is, is very light, almost clear, not very cloudy, we can tell that they are well hydrated. For me personally, I like to take a look at my urine just so I know I'm drinking enough water every day, single day. And you guys should, you know, kind of check yourselves too. Make sure you're getting enough water in your system every day. So again, use we use the color of urine to help us, the color and sort of the uh, clarity of urine to help us determine hydration status. If you ever do full urinalysis, at least with my medical assistants, I would have them, you know, look at the physical appearance of the urine sample. Uh, is it, you know, what color is it? Is it a light yellow versus a darker yellow? Is it clear? Is it cloudy? Uh, we we uh, consider the word turbid uh, to kind of describe cloudiness of the urine. And usually if, if urine is cloudy, it's either coming from a patient who's severely dehydrated or might have some sort of pathological condition going on. So we used Fox Lab 9.3 to do a clinical examination of urine. That was our test strips. Uh, we measured certain things that might be in the sample of urine. We talked about chloride concentration. However, just know that chloride concentration will not be covered on the exam, so we're not going to really talk about it. Uh, we did measure uh, these different substances uh, using this a test strip such as glucose, protein, bilirubin, ketones, and blood. Uh, make sure you know uh, the scientific name for the presence of each of these substances in urine. I've actually included a table in this PowerPoint to so you guys have an idea of uh, the name of the condition if any of these substances are are present in urine. And these are abnormal urinary constituents. So you, these are things that are not not normally found in urine. Uh, for example, if we have glucose within the urine, it's called glycosuria. So notice that we added the suffix urea to uh, the root to show you that there, this substance is present in the urine. Proteins, uh, we have different ways of uh, calling uh, how, when we see protein within the urine, so proteinuria, or specifically albin, albuminuria, so the presence of albumin, this, this uh, plasma protein within the 
the urine. Um, I've stolen the slide from my PowerPoint on uh, urine analysis, so you don't need to know what the possible causes of these conditions are. It is kind of good to know, though. For example, you know, we can see protein in urine due to non-pathological causes. For example, someone who does physical or excessive physical exertion, like working out or pregnancy, can cause uh, protein to show up in the urine. And uh, we consider protein in the urine pathological if it's over 150 milligrams per day, such as glomerulonephritis, so anything that ends in any inflammation of, uh, you know, the the glomerulus within the nephron, a severe hypertension, heart failure. Um, also, protein in the urine can, or proteinuria can be an initial sign of renal disease. Uh, ketone bodies, if we see ketone bodies in the urine, it's called ketonuria, um, usually due to an excessive formation and accumulation of ketone bodies, as in a diabetic patient because they can't use Glucose. This is most likely in uh, type 1 diabetics where they, they cannot utilize glucose properly, so they use uh, other uh, sources for energy, as well as um, people who are undergoing a ketogenic diet. They're avo avoiding um, carbohydrates and sugars, so they break down other things. Uh, or, you know, people who are in starvation mode, again, breaking down um, other substances. Uh, to form ketone bodies, and ketones will then end up in the urine. Hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobinuria. Uh, this is the presence of hemoglobin in the urine, bile pigments. We see uh, bilirubinuria, um, and then erythrocytes, hematuria. Uh, presence of leukocytes or pus, this is known as pyuria. Um, usually due to an infection, a uh, urinary tract infection. So make sure you're comfortable with the scientific name for the presence of each of these substances in urine. What we do not expect to see in urine uh, includes glucose. We know that glucose is completely reabsorbed because we have glucose trans in the proximal convoluted tube to kind of grab glucose from the ultrafiltrate to return um, and reabsorb it in the body. Now, with diabetic patients, uh, diabetic patients could oversaturate their transporters, and that is how we have glucose appearing in the urine. Or, you know, someone who has eaten a lot of sugar and just went on a sugar binge, they can saturate their transporters and then have uh, urine or glucose within their urine. Um, the difference between a diabetic patient and someone who has just binged on a lot of sugar is, uh, you know, glucose will appear in a diabetic patient's urine without having them having to, you know, consume a lot of sugar. Other things that we don't expect to see are, are protein um, and blood. We know that ultrafiltrate means that you know, plasma has been filtered and does not have the presence of protein or formed elements. Um, it does occur, um, and we just talked about, you know, non-pathological reasons for protein to be in the urine, but um, the majority of the time, we do not normally see uh, these substances within urine. Things that we expect to see in urine, but in very small amounts of bilirubin, uh, bilirubin is actually converted to a pigment that allows, uh, or that makes urine yellow, makes pee yellow. Uh, ketones uh, can be there for various reasons. For example, in patients like diabetics who can't use glucose for energy, or you know those who are on a low carb diet, um, uh, they use other fuel sources other than glucose. And you know people who are on that ketogenic diet who don't really consume a lot of carbohydrates or glucose and we actually do have specific ketone test strips um, that you know some of these people who are on these diets like to see if uh, they're able to induce ketosis and it's similar to you know one of these urine strips so there shouldn't be large amounts of any of these in the urine and usually if there are it could indicate an underlying pathology. We know that protein and blood are just too large to get filtered from the plasma into 
of the tubules. Think of, you know, like spaghetti being drained in a colander, uh, the, um, that f uh, filtration membrane between the glomerulus and, and the uh, Bowman's capsule, you know, acts sort of like a sieve to prevent protein and blood from entering the ultrafiltrate. Um, but we know that damage to the kidney can affect the selectivity of that filtrate membrane. Um, blood does appear here, you know, uh, sometimes, especially with women who are undergoing their menstrual cycle. A cycle um, infection, such, a, such as an ascending infection or bladder infection in men and women could uh, cause the presence of formed elements uh, in the urine, um, again, due to some sort of, you know, bladder or ascending infection. So cardiac output is about 5 to 5.5 liters of blood, and about 1 liter of that blood uh, per minute goes to the kidneys. Uh, we are able to calculate renal plasma flow because we know that 60% of that 1 liter per minute of um, blood is plasma, so plasma making up 60% of blood. So based on that percentage, 60% uh, of one liter, we can estimate or calculate renal plasma flow to be 600 milliliters per minute. Okay, glomerular filtration rate. So we said earlier that the plasma that enters the glomerulus, um, about 20% of that will be filtered and become the ultrafiltrate, whereas 80% will leave the glomerulus via the efferent arterial. So if we know that 20% of plasma is filtered, we can take 20% of the 600 milliliters per minute um, of the plasma that goes to the kidneys and estimate GFR to be 125 milliliters, milliliters per minute, okay? So, this is actually a very important number, and you need to make sure you memorize this number for GFR. So, you know, we need to memorize GFR being 125 milliliters per minute. And GFR is homeostatically regulated. Um, it's a homeostatically regulated variable. <clears throat> and, you know, we are using this number when we start talking about clearance. So again, um, kidneys, their main function is to filter, reabsorb, and secrete. So filter, reabsorb, reabsorb the stuff we need, secrete, and then excrete the things that we don't. So combination, again, of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion will determine the concentration of various ions in the plasma and blood. Our, we know our kidneys determine blood volume and then, you know, which blood volume then will determine blood pressure. When we talk about clearance, clearance is actually um, a bit of a topic that is kind of hard to understand. Not hard, but it's a challenge to kind of understand uh, or grasp. Clearance is defined as the volume of plasma cleared of a given solution in a given time. Okay, and we our bodies do clearance by filtration. We use clearance as a non-invasive way to help us assess renal function. And here is the formula for clearance. So we have to take into consideration the things that are reabsorbed as well as the things that are excreted. Um, so the formula for clearance is um, Clearance equals the concentration of whatever we're looking at in urine times the urine production rate, which is represented by V, over the plasma concentration of whatever we're looking at, okay? Um, so plasma concentration of a substance and its urine concentration have to be in the same units. Um, so V, again, is urine flow, flow rate, which we determined in lab earlier. Um, so we took the lab volume 
um, for example, uh, 36 milliliters and divided by that by the time interval of 30 minutes. So 36 milliliters divided by 30 minutes, uh, we got about 1.2 milliliters per minute. Uh, and you know the normal range of urine flow rate is anywhere between 0 0.5 to 5 milliliters per minute. And that was in the earlier slide when we talked about urine flow rate. Before we get into examples, um, in our lab, uh, we needed to determine urine concentration of a substance and plasma concentration of a substance. In our lab, we wanted to measure the urine concentration um, and plasma concentration of uh, blood uh, urea nitrogen or urea. So what we did or what we should have done in lab was uh, after uh, you know we had the patient drink a lot of water and then uh, uh, void or urinate a, a certain volume uh, we took that volume of urine and then we placed it placed an amount about I think 20 microliters we placed uh, an amount in one of those centrifuge tubes um, and diluted it and uh, we were able to um, place it through a spectrophotometer, so, sort of uh, similar to one of the labs we did earlier in the semester. Uh, with regards to plasma concentration of BUN, we filled up those uh, capillary tubes, centrifuged them, and took the plasma uh, that we were able to separate in the capillary tubes and again ran it through this spectrophotometer. Um, we also got a, we had a standard which we you know knew the concentration of uh, got that absorbance and then we plugged those numbers into uh, that equation that Beer's law equation which again that we went over early in the semester you're not going to need to do any Beer's law equations for the upcoming uh, lab exam but know that that's you know what we did in order to get the urine concentrations as well as the plasma concentration. So again, that Beer's Law um, being the concentration in this example of blood ure urea nitrogen equals uh, the concentration of the standard um, times the absorbance of the blood urine urea nitrogen divided by the um, absorbance of the standard. So those numbers we plugged in and we were able to get the, the concentration of the BUN. So we can use glucose as an example, as our first example of uh, how we use um, this clearance formula. So we know that um, Plasma concentration for glucose normally is anywhere between 70 milligrams per deciliter to 100. That's the normal uh, plasma glucose concentration. So let's, for example, use 70. Um, so here we have plasma concentration of glucose, 70 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, we know that urine production rate can be anywhere between 0 0.5 to 5. Here we're going to use 1. Um, Urine concentration of glucose in a normal individual individual should be zero. So, because it just it should not appear in urine. Um, so, using those numbers, we can then plug in to the formula, um, and you know, right off the bat, urine concentration is zero. Multiply that by you know urine production rate. That's zero divided by p. Your number is going to be zero. So clearance of glucose is zero, meaning the volume of plasma cleared of glucose is zero. Okay, so that's one way we can uh, kind of use an example for the clearance formula. So here we see zero milligrams per deciliter um, is the urine concentration. Here's our urine production rate, one ml per minute. And then here is the plasma concentration, 70 milligrams per deciliter. And again, clearance of glucose equals zero milliliters per minute. So this means 
um, if we compare it to uh, GFR, glomerular filtration rate of, um, again, that magical number, 125 milliliters per minute, we know that um, the clearance of glucose is less than GFR, okay, because it's zero, and GFR is 125 milliliters per minute. If clearance is less than GFR, uh, we can say that glucose has been reabsorbed. Okay, so in this case, we know that glucose is 100% reabsorbed because we have none of the glucose appearing in urine. Okay. Another uh, example we can use is penicillin. Penicillin is an antibiotic uh, that is used for, you know, specific type of infections. Um, our body you know, actively secretes penicillin to get rid of it because our body sees it as a foreign substance. Um, if we use the example for penicillin, we can see, you know, if there's a urine concentration of penicillin at 600 milligrams per deciliter, again, keeping that urine production rate of one ml per minute, um, and then plasma concentration being four milligrams per deciliter, we plug that into our formula, uh, Clearance equals UV over P. Um, so clearance of penicillin, we have um, the concentration of urine being 600 milligrams per deciliter. Multiply that by the urine production rates of 1 ml per minute divided by the your, uh, plasma concentration of penicillin at 4 milligrams per deciliter. And we get the clearance value of penicillin to be 150 milliliters per minute. Okay? And knowing our magical number of GFR at 125 millers per minute, we can see that um, clearance of penicillin is greater than GFR. Um, and if clearance is greater than GFR, we can see that um, penicillin is actually partially secreted, so it will appear in urine, okay? So more penicillin is secreted than was filtered. So for our lab 9.2, renal clearance, again, um, we use a spectrophotometer to get absorb absorbance of the uh, blood, urea, nitrogen in the sample of urine that we obtained from a student uh, so that we could get um, urea, uh, uh, I'm sorry, BUN concentration in the urine, as well as BUN concentration in the plasma. Okay, again, you're not going to need to use the Beer's Law to get to get those uh, the concentration of those um, substances either in urine or plasma. But know that you know that is the methodology we used. So after using that formula, we got the concentration of BUN in urine to be um, equal to 825 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, concentration of BUN in plasma is 12.5 milligrams per deciliter. And again, using that urine production rate, um, 36 ml divided by 30 uh, to equal 1.2 milliliters per minute, we can then plug those numbers into our clearance formula, okay? So clearance of BUN uh, with this test student, uh, we get um, urine concentration 825 times urine production rate 1.2 divided by uh, the yeah, BUN in the plasma at 12.5, our clearance is equal to 79.2 ml per minute. Now, is that greater or less than GFR? We know that it is less than GFR. So if it is less than GFR, then urea is partially reabsorbed and partially excreted. Okay. So we can um, have different interpretations of clearance, um, and clearance again being milliliters per minute. Um, if clearance of a substance is less than uh, glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, meaning it's 124 milliliters 
per minute and below, we can say that there is net reabsorption of that substance. Okay. If clearance is greater than GFR, meaning 126 milliliters per minute and above, we can say that there is net secretion, meaning it will show up in the urine. If clearance is equal to GFR, meaning if clearance is equal to 125 milliliters per minute, then we don't have any net secretion or reabsorption. Um, and what will happen is we have 100% of that substance appearing in urine because there's no net secretion or reabsorption. Um, and we're going to assume that if clearance is greater than zero, the solute was filtered. If clearance is equal to zero, uh, the solute was either one, never filtered, so uh, such as proteins and cells, because we know that ultrafiltrate is made up of uh, or doesn't have any proteins or cells. Or if clearance equals zero, we can say that it was completely reabsorbed, um, just like glucose that we saw. Now, if we use the example of protein, we know that there's about, you know, 68 uh, normal uh, value for a protein in our, in our, in our blood, 6 to 8 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Um, what do you think the clearance of protein will be? Again, it's zero because it was never filtered in the first place. So, um, moving on and like talking about clearance being equal to GFR, we know that there is no net secretion or reabsorption. And we have um, different ways to kind of get an idea of what GFR is by having substances um, that have clearance equal to GFR. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. So again, here we have a nice table uh, that shows you uh, an interpretation of clearance. If it's, again, less than GFR, the substance is reabsorbed. If uh, it is equal to GFR, substance is not reabsorbed, not secreted. Um, and then if it is more than GFR, anywhere between 126 to 600, the substance is secreted. And there will be a clearance handout um, that will provide some examples and some explanations. So getting back to finding substances that will equal whose clearance will equal GFR, we have something called inulin. So we have no real natural substances that have the same clearance as GFR, but researchers were able to find a substance known as inulin. Uh, notice, you know, it kind of looks like insulin, but not really. Um, it's, you know, it's not a misspelling of insulin. So inulin was developed to be freely filtered by the kidney. Uh, it is a non-natural molecule used to measure GFR, um, and it's not known to be secreted nor reabsorbed because there are no receptors uh, for inulin in the cells lining the tubules. Uh, now, we can clinically use inulin clearance value to measure GFR. So, again, it's a non-natural molecule, not known to be secreted or reabsorbed, um, so, and we can say that clearance of inulin is the same as GFR. Now, important to note, according to your book, inulin is not normally used for routine clinical applications because it does not occur naturally in the body. In most clinical settings, uh, physicians will actually use creatine to, um, or I'm sorry, creatinine, yeah, creatinine to estimate GFR. Creatinine is a breakdown product of phosphocreatine, uh, which is an energy storage compound found primarily in the muscles. Uh, it is constantly produced in the body and does not need to be administered, unlike uh, inulin. However, it's not the perfect molecule for estimating GFR because a small amount is secreted into the urine. So uh, it the clearance is a little bit bigger or a little bit more than GFR. However, according to your book, the amount is small enough that in most people, 
um, creatinine clearance is used to help estimate GFR. Okay, and here we can actually see some uh, substances and what their normal uh, clearance values are. You don't have to memorize these values, but we can see clearance um, of glucose is normally zero. Uh, explanation for that is that you know it is filtered and uh, completely reabsorbed. Urea, that's something we took a look at um, in our lab. Normal clearance of urea is 65, again being less than uh, GFR. So we can say that urea is filtered and is partially reabsorbed. Inulin, which we talked about, um, having the same clearance value as GFR, uh, we can say that it is filtered and we know that it's not reabsorbed and not secreted. So 100% of it will uh, be excreted out into the urine. Creatinine, um, the clearance for creatinine is about 140 milliliters per minute, um, very close to GFR, but again, um, just a little bit more than GFR. Um, and we can say that it is filtered and partially secreted, partially secreted by the peritubular capillaries. Um, PAH, PAH is actually, it stands for para-amino Hippocratic Acid. Uh, this is something that is used to demonstrate a substance that is completely secreted by the uh, peritubular capillaries. So you don't need to know this, but it's a good to know. So clearance of PAH is actually 600 milliliters per minute. Um, it is used to demonstrate to show that it is filtered and completely secreted. Okay, so that is the discussion on clearance um, for this lab. Um, again, I'll have some of the, uh, I'll, I'll post the worksheet that has some of the clearance, um, the clearance formulas and uh, examples that you can do on your own to kind of uh, help you memorize that, that formula. Um, but, you know, you should know that uh, you, you should know the urine concentration and the plasma concentration of that substance. You should be able to interpret, you know, once we get that clearance, is it, you know, more or less than GFR? And what happens if it is more than GFR or less G than GFR? So if it is less than GFR, we have reabsorption of that substance. Um, if we it is more than GFR, then we have secretion of that substance, okay? So make sure you're able to first calculate clearance of a substance and then uh, interpret it um, in, when we compare it to glomerular filtration rate.